Eurosceptic parties are continuing to do well across the EU. Perhaps then it's not the best time to be calling for greater fiscal and political integration for the Eurozone. That's exactly what the Italian finance minister says is needed if Europe is to tackle the economic crises that it faces. Pierre Carlo Padoan, the former chief economist of the OECD, joined me here in Brussels for the Global Conversation. Pierre Carlo Padoan, Italian finance minister, welcome to the Global Conversation. Thank you for being here. We've seen many uh, Eurozone bailouts over the past few years. What's your outlook for the single currency today? The single currency is much stronger than it used to be three years ago. Since the Greek crisis broke out, we have made in Europe impressive progress in terms of institution building and strengthening, especially in banking issues, but also uh, looking more widely at growth and fiscal uh, cooperation. Can it survive in its current form, though? What, what further reforms are needed, in your view? Well, first of all, we must complete banking union by providing banking union with a common deposit insurance scheme and a full backstop to what is known as resolution, that is to say, to make banks safe if they're not doing well, but also strengthen the growth drivers. And the growth drivers are a more proactive fiscal policy, which should be much more growth friendly and much more effort in structural reforms to raise growth potential in the European economy. If you look at the growth numbers, though, for Italy over the past few years, you look at the real GDP, it's been pretty much flat since the introduction of the euro. Do you think that the euro is, in fact, a straitjacket for growth? It is not if it's, if it's complemented by structural reforms, which we are, what we are doing in the country, to raise growth potential and uh, also a link between the Eurozone and the single market. In other words, I would favour more integration, not just in the Eurozone, but in Europe as, uh, as a wide, in a wide sense. You supported a Eurozone finance minister. Could you explain exactly what you mean by that? What sort of mandate would such a person have? Such a person would have to deal with common resources and what I call European public goods. One example, migration. Migration requires a European-wide strategy to deal not only with emergency in the migration flows, but also building conditions in the origin countries of migrants to have uh, more developed economies, more job opportunities, so that the pressure to cross the sea and come to Europe is much uh, easier than it is now. And also prepare Europe to welcome these uh, migrants, which in the medium term are a blessing for Europe because they raise growth opportunities for the whole of the European economy. Um, given the rise, though, of Euroscepticism in a lot of countries in the EU, I mean, is it really sensible to be proposing that we transfer more power to the European level? Do you not think that will merely f fan the flames of Euroscepticism in a way? It is tempting to blame it on Europe, but it is also important that European challenges are faced with European responses. And uh, we, uh, we see just one fact, that over time, over the decades, Europe has grown through successive integration waves. There is a lot of benefits still to be reaped from greater integration, greater innovation, greater employment opportunities, including through migrants in the long term. And this requires European, not national, responses. Where, where's the evidence for that? If you look at the, uh, you know, the election results in some countries of late, where is the evidence that the public would support such things? What uh, the polls and the vote results show is that European citizens are dissatisfied with an economic model that recently has produced unemployment and recession rather than growth. We need to turn that around and we need to show that Europe can deliver more growth, more jobs, more welfare. It has been so in the past. We can do it also in the future, starting now. I just want to go back to the issue of uh, this fiscal union that you're going to be uh, speaking about today. You're here in Brussels to give a speech at the ULB University. Uh, the president of the Bundesbank, Mr Jens Weidmann, has been very critical of that. Uh, he says he sees enormous obstacles to such a union and no political will to remove them. What would you say to him? Well, I would say that if you go back in the, in the past, uh, for many times what has been achieved was deemed to be unachievable. I, let me quote once again the single currency and the European Central Bank and all other European ins institutions. I'm a strong believer of the fact that Europe must go forward, not backward. If we go backward and there are risks that we do that, 
then this is going to produce a negative shock, not just to single institutions, but the all of the European construction. So we must go forward and gather consensus and political support for those ideas. Could you explain how the uh, backstop that Italy has created to help its banking system will work? It's some five billion euros. Is that big enough? Well, first of all, this is a private sector endeavour. The private sector, private banks and insurance companies, Italians and other countries, have put together resources, first of all, to support recapitalization operations in the Italian banking system and also to produce, to provide resources to kickstart the NPL market, which has been stagnant in the country. Non-performing loans, which non is... Non-performing loans, yes. Uh, also, the government has recently approved measures which will significantly speed up the time needed to recover bad loans, uh, bringing it down from several years to only a few months. This is a very important change which will produce results, uh, stronger results as we move forward. But is this five billion backstop big enough, do you think? This is just a mechanism to start off. It has a leverage power and as confidence grows, the market will generate prices that will make that, that, those resources available. And of course, nothing prevents the private sector to decide to further provide fund for resources with the funds, so make it larger if needed. And if this strategy doesn't work, what's the plan B for saving Italy's banks? This strategy will work and the plan B, uh, which is not a plan B, is what is already going on. A major structural reform, the Popolari banks, mid-sized banks, small banks, which are being uh, deeply restructured. We will have stronger banks, but also fewer banks. So these banks will be able to raise capital on the markets and will provide funding to the economy. This is already ongoing. Just my final question, really. Uh, your uh, country has a big problem with youth unemployment, uh, some 40% of young people uh, are out of work. Uh, what would you say to those young people who are quite dissatisfied with the way uh, the economy is going at the moment in Italy? Well, what I would say to the, those young people is to look at the numbers. Since we have introduced our labour market reform, we have created almost 400,000 new jobs on a permanent basis, which means that not only we have more jobs, but we have better quality jobs. There is a perspective for young people now. And indeed, youth unemployment, yes, you're right, is very high, but it's beginning to decline. This wasn't happening for many years. So we are at the beginning of a phase where we expect conditions for young people to find a job will improve, and also expectations will improve, confidence will improve. So young people will start, for instance, uh, uh, raising money to, to buy a house, which is a sign of faith in the future. Pier Carlo Padovan, Italian Finance Minister, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.